there are those who speak of an ancient planet, still who seek it, but yet not the truth of the Oaks. Until now, I'm Sean. And I'm Arlian. And this is... Immortal Planet. For those not in the know, Immortal Planet is a recent entry in the Souls-like genre by TW Games, creator of Ronin, which places additional emphasis on the methodical combat that Dark Souls tend to embody in tandem with an isometric perspective shift. But does Immortal Planet have what it takes to be a critical hit, or will the dice land on one for this ambitious little title? Let's find out on... Critical Reviews. As with most Souls likes, your first experiences with Immortal Planet will be creating your character. But while most Souls likes tend to give you a wide variety of character customization options, Immortal Planet is content to give you only two, your starting weapon and a trinket that gives you a special passive trait. That said, the starting weapons and the choice of trinkets offered to you, though minimal, do provide enough options for you to already begin working towards your preferred combat build. Thankfully, the game's intro is fairly brief, allowing you to pick up and play fairly quick, by which point you get to enjoy the simple majesty of just how responsive the controller inputs are, and discover what it is that your starting weapon choice even does, since the game doesn't tell you. Unless you have the distinct misfortune of playing this game on a keyboard, in which case the controls are crap. Crap covered in garbage. All control when playing on the keyboard is clunky and unresponsive, forcing you to play even more cautiously than you normally would. Though, you should be playing cautiously to begin with, given that starting enemies are quite capable of beating you to a pulp, especially on Nightmare. More on that later. Sean's misery aside, on my end, the controls felt pretty good, keeping things fairly simple with a button devoted to attack, singular, more on that later too, a run, block, dodge, and the luxury of having a pair of dedicated spell slot and item slot buttons. Ah oh yes, item slots. Your heal is an item. You can totally accidentally run into battle without a heal equipped, and two combat items. Yay. Which does mean that instead of stockpiling heals, you just immediately use them when you try and pick them up, and get slapped in the face during the animation. Oops. And uh, good luck in those boss fights, but when you don't make poor decisions, it means you're not fumbling around trying to scroll to the right spell or item. They are always there, until you head back to the base and change what's equipped. And for those of you out there who actually want to run without healing items, that, that option is there. All the power to you. Yeah, the key mapping itself isn't bad. It's more that the keyboard controls feel very much like an afterthought. To be fair, the game does tell you on the title screen that the gamepad is recommended. The primary issue is that directional inputs are awkward and disorientating, leading to frequent situations where you're left flailing around at nothing because you weren't quite facing the direction that you thought you were. I found that in order to have any idea of which direction I was going to be attacking in while playing on the keyboard, I had to spend most of my time looking at the arrow at my feet rather than enjoying the game's visuals. The reason for this is that Immortal Planet presents the players with a more methodical, slow approach to combat. I personally felt that the game hovered somewhere between a Zelda-style dungeon crawler and a strategic tactical-style game. I suppose the vibe I got from the game was a bit closer to Diablo 1 mashed up with a Souls-like, albeit one that's rather enamored with having platforming segments and a veritable minefield of bottomless pits to remind you that life is cheap. That's not to say that the game's dungeons don't have some interesting and varied obstacles at its disposals. We're saying spike launchers, laser grids, invisible platforms, and flammable acid, oh my. 
but you can be almost positive that a large number of your deaths will be due to gravity's not-so-tender embrace. Man, platforming in Souls Likes generally seems to be an ill-advised choice, doesn't it? So, those open and suspicious looking treasure chests might stop at any time soon. Regardless, given the interconnectedness of the levels, you're at least never too far from a cryopod or from a potentially unlockable checkpoint, which makes traversing the various tombs less tedious post-fatal faceplant. That, and the relatively compact hub area and close proximity to the game's four tombs, cuts down on a lot of unnecessary travel time. Perspective-wise, this game leaves behind the side-scrolling or 3D environments frequently seen in Souls-like games, favoring a more isometric view, with the game's camera cemented in place above the character. This isn't necessarily a bad thing though, as it does provide you with the ability to fully see the area you're fighting in, given that the game's approach to combat is more tactical. And combat in Immortal Plants certainly can feel tactical, not only because of the traditional interplay of managing your stamina whilst attacking, blocking, and dodging enemies who are more than capable of decimating your health, especially when your dodge is more along the lines of a frequently ill-fated backdash slash tackle. Mm-hmm, because if you fuck that tackle up and ram into an enemy with stamina, you get stunned. And if you get stunned, rest assured that the enemy will take full advantage of the situation. That or you just dashed your way right off a ledge. Again. But, yeah, emphasis on enemy with stamina given that your enemies have a bar they need to manage too, and if they're low enough, you can ram into them to knock them back and stun them. And yes, you can cliff them, it's immensely satisfying, and it saves a lot of time with tanky enemies, or if you're running a low physical damage build. Anywho, there's also a parry slash clash mechanic in the game where simultaneous melee attacks cancel each other out, but that tends to favor whoever has the highest stamina bar and attack speed and will frequently end in tears if you think it'll carry you in battle. And it really shouldn't given the attack options at your disposal. Though there's only six melee weapons in the game, each item can awaken by holding the attack key. See, I went back to that whole only one attack button. Transforming into a slower but more powerful variant of its base form and unleashing a special attack during its transformation. Usefulness may vary. Think Bloodborne for how the weapons work. So the base form of each weapon attacks faster and uses less stamina, but the awakened version hits much harder at the expense of speed and increased stamina burn. And speaking of burning, that fire sword, man. just because of that scene. <clears throat> While there are a lot less weapons than what are traditionally found in Souls-like games, Immortal Planet offers no shortage of spell and item combinations to choose from to spice up combat to suit your particular playstyle. I personally really felt that the game's combative diversity came more from the spells and items than the weapons. That said, your usage of items and spells in combat will effectively relegate you to choosing a playstyle. Most items require that you have a certain amount of agility to use them, and spells require that you meet the intelligence requirements to use them as well. And if you do intend on using items or spells, you're going to need to increase your intelligence and willpower respectively, because those stats also dictate how many extra uses of those abilities and items you get until you recharge your uses at a cryopod. That, and intelligence just makes all of them hit harder. And no, this does not extend to the game's health item, Immortal Blood. That has rules all of its own. Oh, and also there is the Psyker Staff item, which also gives you an additional use to your spells, but not your items. Just so we're clear. Yeah, health items are set to 1 if you visit a cryopod, 
unless you've either completed one of the game's hidden challenges, defeated an invader, or acquired the Mortal Blood item, which you can buy from the shop at the hub. Doing any of these increases your blood viscosity by one, which not only allows you to hold an extra healing item, it also causes them to heal you for more and causes the red health left over from an enemy attack to linger longer, therefore making it easier for you to recover it if you either have the relic or spells which can replenish red health. Despite all this, it makes it super important that you memorize the location of those hidden panels in the tomb because that is the only way you're going to be able to stockpile those items. But be careful about those panels. I mean, rule of suspicious chess. It's probably worth it, except when it isn't. And TW Games decided that sometimes when you're desperate on health or maybe pack riding it up, what you get instead of a health item is the most vicious enemy the respective dungeon has, lunging to your face with murderous fury. So, you know, good for your experience, not so much for your health. It's not like the game is particularly stingy in dealing out experience, though. The literally named currency of the frigid planet used to both level stats and purchase items, given that each of its tombs, the game's dungeons, are fairly plentiful with enemies. The design for the enemies generally meshes with the theme of their tune, with the tomb, tome, whatever, with the respective difficulty of their movesets escalating with each new dungeon. Though, the caster enemies remain amongst the most lethal enemies you'll encounter in any of them if you get caught flat-footed, due to their devastating range attacks and their major hard-on for the aggressive use of teleport stabs. It makes them a pain in the ass to actually catch them, and you're quite likely to get backstabbed or suddenly front-stabbed or wherever they choose to teleport. It's wonderful. That was facetious sarcasm. Or this guy. He likes to nuke you with poison. Which sucks hard if you're doing a melee build, because he effectively surrounds himself with a highly damaging AoE to keep you at bay. He is not afraid to spam that ability. Oh, 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 you forgot the best part, man. That shit's flammable, so you end up setting yourself on fire if you're using the fire sword. Good stuff. I mean, also technically good for killing him, but mostly you. Anyways, whilst the enemy design in this game is neat, especially as you progress to the more complicated and dangerous enemies, the relative density of the maps in tandem with the game's overall length means you end up seeing these guys again and again and again. And doubly so if you do the game's various hidden challenges, as those take the forms of multi-wave arena fights. Not knocking them, though, because the arena fights are awesome, given they provide some neat enemy layouts, some tense moments, and a shifting battlefield that I was actually disappointed never showed up in the game proper. Like, seriously, these are just great little battles of attrition. Boss fights each offer their own unique combat experiences in traditional Souls-like fashion. Each boss fight has their own mechanics that make them distinct from fighting a normal enemy. At first. See, each area has two bosses, or rather attempts to give you the illusion that it has two bosses. Because for the exception of the second fight with the twins and the final boss fight, every single second boss of each area is quite literally just a variant of the area's first boss. There are slight nuances between each of a zone's two bosses in that the arena you fight them in is different and they might use different attack patterns between each fight. But all in all I found the boss fights relatively disappointing and uninspired because of this. It's not that the bosses themselves aren't well designed or fun to fight, so much as it is distinctly less exciting to run into that second boss room, only to be faced by the same boss you just beat 15 minutes ago. As for the invader in the game's nightmare mode, he effectively stands in as a zone's mid-boss. The problem with him though is that he is essentially just diet outcast. The less 
threatening version of the game's final boss. Though, to the final boss's credit, if you're not prepared for them, they can be an excellent note for the game to end on, especially given the wide array of tricks at their disposal. Okay, so, I mean, on one hand, I don't, I didn't mind the rematch as much, since a lot of them did switch things around, but on the other hand, I would have liked to see more variety and perhaps had the differences in the boss arena have somehow been incorporated into the boss fight itself. A lofty goal, I know. But yeah, I'd have to say my favorite boss fights in the game were Prisoner Zero, the first fight, not the second, because the second fight is like a symphony of suicides via face plants and pitfalls, and the second fight with the Prophets, because that's a clusterfuck in one of the bosses that actually changes from their first incarnate, and the last boss, whose invader representation is a bit of a letdown, especially as he continues to appear with the same old tricks watered down tricks as an invader. Sad. And on that particular note, the game's nightmare mode is a fairly interesting twist on a new game plus mechanic, as it plants the player into a more difficult variant of the game. Healthier, more damaging foes with remixed encounter arrangements, actually including enemy types from later tombs earlier on. And you're back at level 1, making this an absolutely devilish challenge. Oh, also, that tutorial tomb? Its layout has been completely changed to be extra bastardly, purely to deny you the ability to acquire the equipment the vanilla game effectively hands you in the first couple rooms. You know, that, that gun and that spell you get on a silver platter? Yeah, no. So the upswing of things, however, is that Nightmare Mode starts you off with all three of the relics you'd normally choose between, Hello Improved Dodge, Health Gain on Hit, and Block Plus Improved Defense, and it also allows you to choose any of the weapons you discovered during your, you know, starter run, effectively enabling you to wield your instrument of choice from the get-go. Oh, and there's amplified experience, which really helps in making the build you want to be, especially with how extraordinarily tanky some of those boss fights get. Mortal Planet is, at its core, and as we have repeatedly mentioned, a Souls-like. What does this mean in regards to the game's story? Well, simply put, it's all optional. Where Immortal Planet switches it up from a bit from most Souls-likes is that instead of just collecting lore from NPCs, flavor text attached to items, and stats on the character screen, you also acquire lore by killing enemies which in turn unlocks information pertaining to that particular faction in the game. Now that is not to say that there are no NPCs that dish out a bit of lore, it's just that there is a sparse amount of NPCs to actually be had in this game. This choice to not include a lot of NPCs does benefit the game in giving it a feel of loneliness and hopelessness that is so common among Souls-like games. I for one really enjoyed the story presented here. Basically, you awaken from cryosleep to find that insomnia and insanity has overtaken the entire population of the immortals, as something called the cycles has been interrupted. In your search to figure out what has happened, you are tasked by a computer to find a way to re-implement the cycles and restore sanity to your fellow immortals. Real tragedy here is that this story never really saw its conclusion, and it is very likely that a few key details will never find their way into the game. Which is just so unfortunate, because for me, the writing is hands down this game's strongest suit. Honestly, the writing in this game is fantastic, and definitely part of what had me coming back to it, especially since the various bits of background that you pick up form a really intriguing and frequently nihilistic narrative with hints at things that might belong in like a Lovecraft story. It's a different kind of horror story, honestly, and it's one that's tastefully done, and in such a way that a secret chunk of dialogue, one of the game's major secrets and tied to an item in fact, manages to completely alter the way that players look at the game and everything they're doing, and may have done if they've already finished the game once already. 
So yeah, considering what all the lore was building towards, it's a bit disheartening that we never quite got to unravel the game's true conclusion. But that doesn't detract from the fact that the game has top-notch writing and solid ambience. Graphically, Immortal Planet is fairly nice to look at, with its animated art style being clean and well-defined. The environments give off a very frigid and desolate ambience as you spelunk through the various tombs, which certainly fit the post-apocalyptic setting of the game. That said, given the extremely structured manner in which the levels are laid out, everything's pretty much rectangular, in tandem with the fact that the most distinctive thing that stands a lot of the dungeons apart from each other is the color scheme slash pattern of their walls, and you'll find that a lot of the environments begin to feel a little bit samey beyond the actual layout slash traps. And whilst I can understand that the lack of round edges is because in tandem with the dodge mechanic it would have likely led to more deaths, the fact that the most distinctive dungeon from the rest is the Forbidden Temple which has masses of slime creeping over its structures might just say a little something about the overall aesthetic. I didn't mind the art design too much other than a lot of it seemed very samey to me as Arlene mentioned. Each area had just enough to make them feel somewhat distinct enough that you were at least able to tell where you were in the overall game map just by looks alone. But beyond that, each individual area carries the same overall feeling that any other area does. We'll be fair and say that this is likely a result of going for that high-tech industrial vibe. Let's face it, high-tech usually results in a lot of right angles and metallic structures. But it ultimately ends up making the environments start to feel a bit stale and boring after a while. The enemy designs are neat and creative, but I ended up feeling like a lot more work went into designing every character except the one you play as. The Awake Walker ends up looking so boring and bland by comparison. There was just some things missing about his character model to give me the impression of a distinct and memorable character. So, when it comes to my final thoughts, at the end of the day, when I think of Immortal Planet, it is fondly. I enjoyed the combat, even if I wish there was a bit more nuance to it, simply because juggling the interaction between items, spells, melee attacks, and their awakenings was a fairly enjoyable process to me, especially while I was experimenting with different builds and on higher difficulties. My biggest issue on the gameplay side was simply that the game felt somewhat short. My initial playtime didn't quite hit the 5 hour mark, and my first nightmare mode run took about 4.5, and, and I left that feeling like there was something missing. Like the game had come to one of those halfway or three quarter in cliffhangers and just stopped and stuck an ending there. I think if the game had stuck in another dungeon or two, some new enemies, maybe another 2-3 to three unique boss encounters to chew on with some more melee weapons to tinker with, it probably would have hit that sweet spot. I also felt like the lack of switching weapons could have uh, ended up feeling a bit dry at times, since it meant waddling back to the cryopod if you wanted to change tactics, and then back again if that didn't work, and limited the sort of silliness that could have been opened up by comboing between different melee weapon types. There is at least a patch planned for a few months down the line meant to add some unique fights and more melee weapons to, you know, answer my gameplay gripes as it were, but that doesn't fix the simple fact that as much as the game feels like it's been cut off, so does the story. It's excellent writing, don't get me wrong for one moment on that, but the way it's written hints and teases towards another outcome and a lot more background and lore and knowledge. And what it hints towards is just ultimately absent, and that's a shame. It's for these factors that I place the game as more or less a good, solid entry, and something that I enjoy in which state is a good game, but not something that I would enthusiastically gush about to all my friends and try and get them to play. Though, I would totally probably point it out to someone that I thought or knew was a Souls-like enthusiast looking for a quick fix.
I can't say that I share all of Arlene's positivity regarding this game when everything's said and done. Overall, I'm left with the feeling that this game suffers from too many ideas that were never fully completed. It seems to me that this game does not fully know what it wants to be, and it ends so abruptly right as I'm starting to enjoy the game. The boss fights were a huge source of disappointment for me too. When I think Souls-like, I think numerous, complex, distinct boss fights that are extremely memorable. Not the cookie cutter encounters that we get in this game. And it's lack of accessibility for people who do not have a gamepad or do not like playing games on a gamepad further serves to push me away. I feel like the combat system is mediocre and it has been plagued with balance issues since the game's inception. Most problems you encounter can ultimately be solved with increasing your stats without ever needing to actually get good at the game. Now, I enjoyed the lore enough that I'm willing to say that the destination is worth the journey to an extent. But even the lore is soured by the reality that it is, in fact, incomplete. We are left missing details that were intended to be put in the game, but due to poor game sales, those details will probably never find their way in. With all these features resonating as just okay with me, and the knowledge that the game's story is effectively incomplete, I'm really just left wondering what could have been were it that this game were given a longer development period. All in all, I would say the game is worth eh, a single playthrough. Get your adventure, collect your story, and then move on with your life.